Apple Smart Card is uh, zeg maar die permanent currency machine. Altijd blauw. Zeg maar als je de kaart eruit haalt, die blijft in de staat gewoon te, in de staan. Ja, precies. Ja. Ja, is, dat, is dat micro edition of is dat nog kleiner? Ja, ja, ja. Die heb ik ook voor micro edition. Die stond ik voor jou. Ja, die had schoot zelfs geen int, hè, in die, uh, in die Java. Geen int. Nee, precies. <laughs> Oké, okay, beste mensen, welkom in de uh, presentatie van Eduard Jong over Java Car Technologie. Een onderwerp waar ik niet zo veel van af weet, maar uh, ik heb intussen begrepen dat je zelfs geen... Oh, oké, okay, sorry. We start again. Please, welcome people to this uh, talk of Java Car Technology. It's a subject I don't know uh, very much about, but uh, Eduard de Jong is going to tell you everything about it. Eduard. I have my mic here. So let's begin by uh, telling uh, who is uh, present here. I started in smart cards uh, way back in 1990 when I joined David Schaum uh, building a uh, smart card system for payments, anonymous and all, all kind of advanced cryptography. Uh, after three years I uh, had enough of that and did my own stuff. And in the meantime I uh, came in con contact with uh, the hacking world in Galactic Hacker Party. Uh, then I moved to California, where I uh, built a, uh, started a company together with some French guys, and I made a so smart card software to run an operating system, and I became Java Card. And so the last years until 2008, I worked at some microsystems, trying to convince the world about the beauty of Java Card, which I can share with you right now. So first. I need to know a bit, little bit about where you are and how detailed I can get going. Um, have anybody here of you done anything with Java? Oh, that's quite a fair amount. Good. That makes life easy a bit. Let me see. Does it do the work? Yes. Uh, smart cards. Oh, good. Oh, that makes life a bit easier too. That's a small amount, good. I have at least some people who don't know I can teach something, good. Um, well, this one is, we'll skip this one. Um, so, four parts in my talk. First, we talk about smart cards, just for those who haven't been aware of how things are going. Um, about the Java card technology in its own right, then what can you do with smart cards and with Java card, how can you work with them? And then finally, I talk about security which is always an interesting topic to look at, especially in the context of trying to use it in your own way. Smart cards, what are they? What are they made of and what can we do with it? Let's see. It's a plastic card usually, usually in the card of a form of an ID, but in most cases there's a piece cut out and you get the ID zero format which is, called, which is going into the GSM phones. It's a 60-bit CPU nowadays, has a fair amount of ROM, some E-square, and some RAM. When we started in 1990, it was quite different. It was 8-bit CPU, 128 bytes of RAM, 3K of E-square, and about 8 kilobytes of ROM. That was the, the kind of operating system that triggered development of very special software that would run and be programmable, etc. I.O. Most cards are still using contacts. Some cards don't use contacts. There are, when they are contacts, there are eight contacts. Five of them are used. At least five of them are used in the normal way. If you use, have a USB card, only two are used. The two are, which are not used in the other case. And if you have an NFC card, which is sometimes in modern GSM phones, the fifth pen is also used as well. There's, the contactless cards also exist, are claimed to be in the RFID world things that smart cards are RFID tokens, but smart cards existed way before RFID existed. The communication with a card is always based on a particular protocol, which is called APD protocol, and I will talk about it a bit later. But it's particular to smart cards, whether you use contacts or contactless, or whether you use USB or not, you always talk with the card using that 
particular smart card protocol. Smart cards are special. They have secured silicon. And the silicon has been attacked and has been strengthened. And at that point in time, we have basically no database that you can see and probe. It's completely down deep in the silicon. Um, memory is encrypted. The data passed on memory to the CPU is encrypted. And only decryption happens just before the data is being processed in the CPU or in the crypto hardware, which is also there. There are all kinds of sensors. If you try to shine light at it, if you try to do radiation, if you try to remove the passivation layer and try to make contact with the contacts, all those things will be detected. Of course, all sensors can be defeated, but it's just a, met a battle between those who try to break in and those who protect. And then, of course, there is a lot of obfuscation happening on what is on um, to prevent you from gleaning anything from what the processor is doing in speed or in, in uh, current use. And it contains crypto hardware. It contains hardware to doing RSA computations. Most the new ones have a little curve hardware. They have this hardware always. Some have DA hardware, and there is always a hardware a random number generator nowadays. This makes this uh, chip very good for doing cryptography and security. It is like a much smaller version of the hardware security model which you find in, in the, the server farms that use SSL. Smart cards are uh, last year. I looked it up. There is, it's on the website uh, somewhere. Uh, there's memory cards, which are cards which are stupid. They have no, they have uh, no programmable CPU. They have some logic usually. This is the, the MyFair Classic is the main example, and the, the major part of this 900 million cards are MyFair Classic cards being used in public transit or in uh, 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 telephone cards. All the cards which are programmable. The CPU cards, three billion cards went down into the GSM market last year. And uh, then there was a whole lot in governments, that's citizen ID cards and um, cards for the employees for the of government. The EMV cards, the, the debit and credit cards, which you can use all over the world, are also a light fraction. This is about 10 times more, or 20 times more than the number of CPUs shipped for um, desktop computers and laptops. It's about the same amount of processors shipped as uh, if for all, all the embedded uh, processors in the world. And it's about the same amount as the cores that are embedded in processors like handsets. So smart card chips are really a very big business for silicon manufacturers. Although it's big in volume, it's not big in dollars because the price on most smart cards is very low. At volume, you pay $1.50 or $2 for a, a smart card. The higher smart cards which now are available with 32-bit processors and much larger memory are much more expensive. So the big volume is still in the low-cost cards. And uh, Smart cards are basically used for uh, uh, DSM. That's the bulk of a passport. A very nice uh, application where lots of things have to be done about have been done about uh, trying to use them and make them useful. It's very hard, uh, especially since IKEA, who started